Um, my name is Wendy Schiller. I'm a professor of political science and uh, director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy. Today, we're very excited to kick off our 2021-2022 uh, season of the seminar, Rhode Island Politics and Policy. So I'm gonna turn it over to the leader of that uh, year-long seminar, Mark Dunkelman, uh, who will also serve as today's moderator. And uh, we are very excited to have uh, Lieutenant Governor Spin Matos with us today. Mark? Thank you, I'm thrilled to do this. And Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for uh, for taking this off for us. We're, we're thrilled to do it. It's meant to be sort of a more intimate gathering to speak to students who are generally interested in public policy, are probably somewhere, have a germ in their brains about making a life in public service um, and learning from you sort of about your journey. So, you know, I know that you that probably Brown students being as uh, resourceful as they are, has probably Googled you and, and know something about your story. Um, but I'd love to just give give you a moment to sort of tell us how you went from being, uh, I think, the, the daughter of a mayor in the Dominican Republic to becoming the lieutenant governor of, uh, of Little Rhodey. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, just to give us a sense, I, I we'll, we'll want to dig down a little bit in some of the, some of the sort of key decision points in your journey, um, uh, because I think that that's, that's sort of crucial is for people who are at the beginning of their journeys to understand what's ahead of them and what are the factors that would push them toward, toward public service or toward community service or for the private sector or what have you. But, but if you, I'd rather than me tell your story for you, I'd love just to hear you sort of explain how you went from point to point to point and end up in such an august position. So thank you uh, for having me here. So I immigrated to the United States from the Dominican Republic in 1994. I came as an adult already. I was 20 years old when I arrived here. Um, originally, um, my family is very typical for Dominicans to come to um, New York City, Washington Heights is kind of the place where we come to. And then after we move um, to other states uh, within the United States. That was my case. I arrived here with my parents and my sister in on a Friday, and for Monday they already had a job lined up for me, and everybody thought that was great. It was my first job ever. I couldn't understand what was so great about it at the beginning, <laughs> but once you live here in the in the United States, you understand the importance of that. So I um, I stayed in New York in uh, New York City for two and a half maybe three months while my parents and my sister came to Rhode Island to start uh, looking for an apartment and getting um, our life in in Providence situated. Um, one of the things that I always remember I used to uh, work on a factory in I was. Um, the person that I was replacing is, was the person that was in charge of bringing the designs back and forth between the factory and the Manhattan designers. So early on, I was taking the subway uh, by myself within this, um, the first week, two weeks of my being in, here in the United States, which I think it tells a lot about what my experience has been in this country. It's like get thrown in the middle things and figure it out. So I think that was my beginning. I always remember that one of the things that we did a lot was packaging clothing and the movie, The Lion King was coming out at that time. So everything we were doing was packaging a children's clothing with the Lion King um, uh, characters all over. Um, eventually I um, came to, to Providence because uh, I knew this is where we wanted to establish my, with my family. I came to Providence in I started working in factories here. Uh, one of the factories that I worked was in um, the jewelry factory, which is uh, Sarovsky Jewelry in Cranston. Uh, the work that I was doing there was packaging jewelry in um, what we call picking orders. So when there's an order from, from customers, um, that's what I did until my parents told me and my sister to go back to school and that they would take care of paying the bills uh, so we could 
go back to school. Um, while I was working at a factory, I was taking ESL classes at the International Institute, then went to CCRI. Then when I decided to go to school full time, I went to Rhode Island College. At Rick, I took some English classes while I was starting taking classes in my um, career. Um, my major, which was communications, all, all of the things, I don't know why I, want, I wanted to make my life more difficult while I was learning English. So I went for communications, public relations. Um, in, while I was at, at the um, at Rick, I was required to do an internship um, in order to graduate from communications. I, I was very shy and I was a, a afraid to go to a place that everything was gonna be English. I didn't feel confident um, going to a media that was gonna be everything English. So I reached out to the Spanish radio station um, and asked them if I could do an internship with them. They say yes. And then I started doing my internship there and volunteering with them, doing community relations with them. And eventually uh, after graduating, I, I continued working with them. While I was going to college, I was also working at Citizens Bank in the, um, the branch and after the call center. But my experience with the radio station connected me with a lot of the Latino community here in the state of Rhode Island. I was able to meet um, uh, with um, friends like Melba de Pina, who was uh, one of the leaders of the a Latino Political Action Committee and Latino Civic Fund. And that helped me a lot to connect with what was happening in, in, within the Latino community and the state of Rhode Island and learn a lot about the issues. In the meantime, also, I was very active in my neighborhood. I was part of the Neighborhood Association and also was a board member of Univille Housing, which is one of the organizations, the well, CBC Community Development Corporation that uh, was building or has been building uh, affordable housing in the neighborhood. And I never thought I was gonna be the candidate uh, through my work, uh, my connection with Melba and the Real PAC. I volunteer for several campaigns and, and I really enjoyed that. I, some of the uh, few of uh, the beginning uh, campaigns that I was um, volunteering for was when Merce Bjork ran for governor at that time. So she would have been the first woman governor and I was um, a lot of energy working on, on that campaign at that time. Um, in other campaigns, I really enjoy um, the energy that happens on election day. And if, if you have not done it, I invite you to do that. Volunteer for somebody else's campaign and see the energy and, and the adrenaline going crazy on election day. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Some of us think that it's fun. Uh, but I never thought I was going to be the candidate, actually, until two council members approached me and asked me to run for office. And they said, um, they said that I was very interested on, I care about what was happening in my neighborhood. In my neighborhood, um, they felt needed a uh, new boys. The person that was the council person for the uh, Oneville Silver Lake and the West End at that time, and Valley, uh, she had been in office for 24 years at that time. Um, the neighborhood had been changing a lot and there was a little bit of disconnect with the um, uh, neighborhood and the newcomers. And they suggested that I run. Um, at the beginning, I said no. Because I, as I said, I never wanted to be an elected official. But they insisted. They said, you know, just think about it and, and get back to us. And that's what I did. I started thinking about where I was at that moment in my personal life. And I just, I have finished my, um, my college education, was transitioned between jobs. And also, um, I was a single mother at that time. And I think I wanted to... Uh, redirect the energy of my personal life also into something more positive. And I said, yes, I decided to run. And the first time that I ran for office, I didn't win at that time. So I, um, and then I, I thought I was not going to run again, <laughs> but then um, I decided to run a second time. Um, and so the first time I ran was in 06. 
um, I didn't win that time, then I ran again in 2010. And at this time I was um, elected to represent uh, Ward 15 in the Providence City Council. Um, in the, sorry, the neighborhood of Oneville, Silver Lake Valley. Originally I was representing part of the West End, but after redistricting, the West End is not part of Ward 15 anymore. And I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, I'm covering a lot at once, but uh, uh, Mark and um, Professor, I don't know if you want me to go deeper into any particular area, but I was trying to give you the overview. Well, that, that's an amazing overview. And we want to get to the whole dynamic of, of uh, being asked to serve as Lieutenant Governor as well. Uh, but I do also want to say to the students that are attending that feel free to do a QA and a and, and if you want to ask um, Lieutenant Governor uh, Matos, any questions, feel free to interrupt. This is supposed to be more conversational. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a question, you know, please either put it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll, we're happy to call on you because we do want it to be uh, conversational. Uh, Maria has a question already. <laughs> yeah, I'll kick us off. So before you go into the later part of the conversation, I was wondering, um, you mentioned you never, you know, sought to hold elected office, but you did volunteer in a lot of campaigns. So what do you think sparked that initial interest to volunteer and get involved? Uh, I connected with the Rhode Island Latino Political Action Committee, and I learned a lot about what was affecting the community through them in the Rhode Island Latino Civic Fund. So that was kind of the most uh, motivator factor for me to get involved. And But I never thought that I needed to be in elected office in order to um, participate and engage in what was happening. I, to be honest, I was uh, shy and I was okay just being in the background and helping somebody else uh, get elected. But that changed. So just to follow up, that changed for you when you yeah. saw an opportunity, you were approached. This is a big deal. Just to quickly interrupt, this big deal in political science, in the literature on women in politics, you know, are they approached, are they asked to run all those sorts of things um, mm -hmm. as much as men are? And the literature so far says that they're not asked to run as much as men are, but you were. So that's just a really Correct. interesting dynamic. Good. And I believe that I'm a typical research uh, uh, data uh, shows that we have to be asked several times as female to run for office. It's the same was the case with me. When I was asked to run for office, I just felt like I'm not ready. Um, I, I didn't feel as, as strong enough with my knowledge of the English language. I was very uh, self-conscious about how would I add, how would I speak in front of um, someone that is a native speaker. Uh, I thought I needed to get prepared, that I needed to, th this is typical what, um, Many of the female candidates go through. We never think that we're we're ready um, in in we run for office because we're asked. And I'm making a point now whenever I um, speak in front of students or females, um, in other new immigrants. Also, I just make sure I ask them when are you going to run for office to make sure because the average is seven, right? So I always say, okay, here's one of the sevens. I'm asking you right now, when are you going to run for office? No, it's, it's great. That is great. And that, that's what we, you're pointing to things. It's great when we write things and print them in academia, but then somebody who's doing it in real life says, yes, that's yeah. exactly how it works. So yeah. That's great. Um, so do we have any other, before we uh, continue uh, on your journey, do we have any other questions um, from students? Students are, um, okay. So then I think, um, Mark, do you want to continue? Sure. I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to hear about the I guess I'm happy to hear about becoming lieutenant governor, but I am sort of curious about barriers you faced in the course of your career that you wouldn't have expected. That you know you were asked to run, you ran, you lost, you you know, you sort of got up, wiped yourself, you know, sort of uh, 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 got ready again. Um, I'm not sure what the idiom I'm looking for is, and 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 ran again. You, I, I would expect that lots of people after one unsuccessful campaign would sort of say, "Ah, so that's that door is closed for me. I'm moving on to becoming a community activist." What do you think gave you the gumption to try it again? And then 
I am sort of curious later, later when you're in the city council, I know that there's a lot of jostling to become the city council president. Um, mm -hmm. I, I assume fairly sharp elbows that we, that the public doesn't see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and yeah. what is it that helps you persevere through that? And how do you, how do you think about that and metabolize it so that you understand when a door is actually closed and when you should actually keep knocking? So glad you you asked that question. So I can tell you, um, when I ran the first time, the first time I ran for office, I didn't realize how big of a challenge it was going to be running against a 24 years incumbent. Like now that I've been in politics uh, I, for this long, I understand how big of a challenge that was, and in people they don't want to get involved in my campaign or help me because they were afraid that I was not going to win and how that's going to be a problem for them um, doing um, business with the city and things like that. So it was tough. And I, after I lost, I didn't think I was going to uh, run again. But just by running for office in just showing that I was serious about it and doing the work because it's not just it's saying hey, I'm running for office, but you're not doing the work. It takes a lot of door knocking and, and, and a lot of dedication. So I did the work. I think people was able to see that. So when I decided to run a second time, I was able to get more support. There were more people willing to help me because they knew that I was serious about the work. I was doing my part. Uh, once I... Um, was elected to the city council, um, there's a lot that comes in about learning to do the work inside of the city council chambers and city hall. And, and as you said, there's a lot of things that people don't see. Um, we run for office, we wanna get things done and we wanna, we are frustrated and then you get elected and the first frustration you have is like, why things take so long? Right? <laughs> and then you start learning the process, how you have to work with your colleagues and find um, support in, it's not a dictatorship. This is a democracy. Democracy is messy. You need to work with others. You need to get to a compromise um, in, in, in order to ad advance uh, the things you care about. Um, the first term, it was a lot of learning experience for me, learning to, um, how things work and how I'm able to um, accomplish things. Um, in, in part of what people don't know is the, the politics of politics, like the internal things that happens in, in the city council. So when I was first elected, I was supporting a team of um, someone who was once running to be council president um, that, uh, that was at that time Councilman Aponte and he um, didn't um, get the votes. He didn't win the presidency. The president was uh, Michael Solomon became president of the Providence City Council. Originally, I was not part of Solomon's team. So the Solomon team was formed and I was not part of leadership. There were seven of us that were not part of leadership. Originally, I was not part of any committee. And what I did, and when I was elected at, at that moment, I was the only female elected to the Providence City Council at, at that the only female in the whole city council at that moment. We had several females in the past and, and after we had, uh, we had finally had our first uh, majority female uh, council members, but at that moment I was the only uh, female. I participated of all of the meetings that I was, that I could, I attended I knew I have to learn a lot, so I attended all of the finance committee meetings and um, asked questions, but in, was very engaged. And to the point that people saw that I was a member of the finance committee, but I wasn't. <laughs> I just was always, um, I, I knew I have a lot to learn. So I, I was going to as many meetings as I could. Eventually, almost like a year into the term, I realized that I couldn't spend this my first term in the city council and don't accomplish anything in that in order for me to accomplish uh, the work, I needed to work with the leadership who, who was in leadership at that time. 
I approached Council uh, President Salomon at the time, and I told him that I wanted to um, join his team. And at this point, um, he appointed me to the Finance Committee and to other committees. I started a, a, a Women's Issues Committee also. And so I joined his team. I started working um, in, in the things that I care about and the areas that I'm was worried a lot in my neighborhood representing Oneville with the challenges that, that we have. One of the reasons why I also wanted to run for office is it Oneville had like this negative um, um, connotation, everything negative people wanted to point out to Oneville. And, and I was frustrated because I knew that there was a lot of good people, decent people that live in the neighborhood that, we, that didn't deserve to be used like, as the punching line for negative things. So that was one of the driving forces for me to get involved and running for office. So I, I started working with the leadership at that time to get um, uh, projects happening in my neighborhood, um, investing in parks. I, I always think that in Providence, we pay a lot of taxes and we don't see what we're paying for. So especially in, in the neighborhoods that I represent. So I started very um, intentional to put resources into parks and recreations and other things that people can see what their taxes are, are accomplishing. Um, then moving on to um, the that term of the city council and the, the, for the second, I didn't have an opponent for that time, um, my, my reelection for the city council. Then uh, for, after the elections comes the election of council president again. Then Councilman Aponte ran for council president again. And, um, and he had a team. I approached him about um, running at that time, but he was committed to running. And I, the, the individuals that he has on his team their politics were more in line with my politics and the things that I wanted to see um, happening. So I supported him for council president and um, he was elected council president. Uh, at that time, then I was uh, elected uh, pro tem. So I was um, pro tem for some of you that is kind of like vice president of city council. And, um, the things were moving along well. We were uh, working in the air, things that we care about, our policies that we have um, um, similar um, interests on. Then things happened in which he stepped down for, uh, from the position and I became the interim um, president of the city council in 2017. Um, it was, um, Tough time for us in the city council. I, I was be, being the pro tem, I became the uh, acting council president, but the rules are not clear um, in the city council charter and the rules of the city council. So instead of automatically the pro tem finish the, um, the term, um, it opens the door for, okay, um, what I was getting from other uh, council members, oh, well, the rules are not clear. We need to have elections. So I was trying to secure uh, the support, um, but in, in, in that time, uh, two members of my team uh, supported someone else. And then um, they elected, uh, as there was seven months in the position, they elected another council person as president. It was a really tough uh, process for me to go through. Um, and, but I, what I have learned is that how you handle the seat and how you handle uh, when you lose is as important as when you win. So I was um, willing to be a support to the new leadership and to um, everything I can to, it was important for me for the city council and for the staff just for us to move on. And um, in, in, in that's how I handled the situation. You know, it, it, it's not about me or how I felt or, or um, at that moment, it's just we needed, we needed to move on um, as, as a body. 
Uh, then after the next election, I did have an opponent. Um, everyone um, basically count me out because I have lost the presidency of the city council. I um, was, had an opponent, which was, uh, had a lot of support from people that didn't want to see me back in the city council. So um, I had a, a tough re-election, um, tougher than what was um, expected, uh, but I was able to win my, my re-election and then I was able to put together the vote um, to become the council president. So for my last term, I became council president um, again, which um, no one thought that it could happen, especially since I have already lost the presidency once. Um, but I was the council president until um, I was appointed now lieutenant governor um, in early this year. Danny, did I, did I see you raise your hand? I, I didn't, oh, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I was wondering, um, have national political issues played any part in your like campaigns or is it mostly focused on local issues? And has that changed at all over time? So um, I started getting involved with the Rhode Island uh, Latino Political Action Committee. At that time, there was a, a strong national movement anti-immigrant movement going on nationally so that i would say was one of the national things that i got involved with uh when it comes to the city council running for the city council you'd be surprised people care more about what's happening is my trash being picked out is that stop sign um on uh is that property that is too noisy so uh, city council is very basic uh, for the voters. It's very basic about what is affecting their daily lives, right? But one of the things that I um, always have an interest on and that I have been working and I work with my colleagues in the city council is the, the housing issue. Housing, I, 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 as I said before, I was part of the a board of Unibel Housing. I have seen the importance of building affordable housing in the community, uh, how it, how much is needed, but also how working with um, organizations like Unibel House and you can transform a neighborhood, you can transform a block, and you can be very intentional. So housing has is an area that is, I think, is a problem that we have uh, in nationwide. But right now in Rhode Island, we have a, a big crisis um, when it comes to housing, uh, housing and homelessness. So that's kind of an, an, an area that is um, broader that I've been um, very interested in working on. Also, when I was in the city council, I, um, I'm a big supporter of small business. So uh, I'm always was trying to figure out ways how I could support the small business community, whether it was partnering with um, um, organizations like the Center for Women and Enterprise. It, again, one of the, the challenges in the Oneville neighborhood um, I, I partnered with the Center for Women's Enterprise in, in which, and I went door knocking with them uh, to talk to the small business in the Oneville community to provide resources, uh, technical assistance, what they needed. Uh, so that's another area that, that I'm always very interested on and that, that I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, could I just jump in and follow up on uh, Donnie's excellent question? Uh, uh, which is to say, what do you think the democratic leadership in Rhode Island uh, or even nationally gets wrong about the Latino quote unquote community, right? Or the Latino vote in terms yeah. of being, you know, a singular entity. Obviously we have Dominicans, we have Puerto Ricans, we've Guatemalans among others, right? Rhode Island is super diverse in that way. So what do you think they get wrong about it? And second, what do you think they, how do you think they underestimate in particular the role of Latino women in, in moving politics, of, you know, and, and being community activists? Oh, we're missing, we just need a volume. We just need a volume thing again. I don't think they underestimate the, the, um, the, that we, like any other community, we care about education, the economy, housing, and sometimes they just want to talk to us about, we care about immigration and that's it, right? And that's not the case. 
Uh, we care about quality of life. We want to make sure that we live in a neighborhood that is safe, that is secure, that um, we have access to the services, government services that uh, are, are working, um, that the trash is being picked up. Sometimes they just assume, uh, make the assumption that we just care about one issue and that's it. And like any other community, we want um, to make sure that our kids get a good education, right? That we would like to have access to good education for, uh, in our neighborhoods where we are. And, and if we don't have it, we're gonna do whatever we can to provide for a better education for our children. But I can tell you even based on, I'm a, I was a big, I'm still a big Hillary supporter, right? Um, when everybody was going in the Obama, I admit I, I was Hillary to the end. <laughs> I was Hillary to the end. I have been a big supporter uh, um, uh, of her of female um, leadership in, in everything that she has accomplished. And in, for the election of the 2016, I remember that this um, national uh, campaign person came to town. I, I was, a, I was a, um, an elector uh, for Hillary campaign. And he had, they had a meeting at the Democratic uh, Party offices. And I brought, I brought up this to them. I told them that once, you know, first of all, they had a phone call with Latino uh, leaders, right, in Rhode Island about how we were gonna uh, get out the vote and get things, um, make sure the Latino community is out voting. Then when we asked if they were gonna hire someone to, uh, get the vote out for the Latino community. Oh no, we don't have like the Hillary campaign. How much money was that? <laughs> they didn't have money uh, to mm. hire someone to uh, help get the vote out in the Latino community. So basically it was gonna be led up to us, the Latino leaders here in Rhode Island to get the vote out. And then um, there was not resources. I asked if they were gonna have advertisement that we can place ad in the local um, radio station and local media. No, there wasn't. So I think they, it, this happens a lot with the national um, campaigns. They think that we're just gonna come out and there's, there's no need to invest in, in getting the vote of the Latino community uh, or minority communities as, um, in general. So I think that the national campaigns need to understand that they have to invest in, in our community. When that person came from the National Hillary campaign, I remember I brought up an issue because I was door knocking for a friend of mine that was running for office. And I remember door knocking to, it was a, a, a Caucasian female, probably 50, close to 60 years old in, when we were asking for the vote, she says, oh yeah, Democrat, always vote Democrat. So you can count on, uh, you can count on my vote. Although I'm gonna make a change this year at the top. I had almost like a panic attack because I was like, this is a vote that should be 100% for Hillary, right? And I brought that up and it, I think like, it was taken like, it's not, it's not a big deal, like, like nothing to worry about. And um, I think the, the party needs to listen more to the people that are on the ground and needs to make sure that they are resources. Yeah, that's fantastic. That is a fantastic, um, you know, articulation of what a lot of the people said was wrong, part of what was wrong with that campaign and part of what's wrong with the Democratic Party leadership at the top. Even in 2020 in Florida, if you look at Latino turnout and vote choice, you saw Trump did uh, better than people thought he would do in Florida, much less also in Texas. Mark, just want to. Well, I, I, I want to give, I think we only have the Lieutenant Governor for another five minutes. So if, if any other students have questions or follow-ups or a second question, I want to, I don't want to step on anybody. Um, could I ask one? For sure. Awesome. Um, so hi, uh, hi uh, Governor. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, in a similar vein to what you just said about the Hillary campaign, um, I was just wondering what you thought about, like, how politics in the U.S. is becoming sort of increasingly 
uh, I guess, depicted as being a racial issue, like, um, you know, being split across, you know, racial lines, Latino, Black, white, um, whereas maybe it's actually a question of um, it being like a class issue in the sense that like you have working class people and obviously the elites that have a lot more power than the rest of us. Um, and I was just wondering what you thought about how the media depicts this division. Um, why do you think they focus so much on the race aspect and not on, you know, the wealth gap? That's a great question. And I have to tell you, um, some of the things that, that I have noticed happen in, in, in this country, in, and I have to say, I have to talk about January 6th. Because as an immigrant from um, a Dominican Republic and that came as an adult, that watching in the news in Dominican Republic, I could see things that was happening in other similar countries. I never thought that something like that was going to happen here in the United States, right? And I'm worried to see that something like that happens here in, the, in this country. To me, uh, this country is like should be like a beacon of a democracy and like an example for um, other countries to follow. Um, I'm I'm very proud to be an American. I became a U.S. citizen and to be part of this nation. And I'm concerned that if we don't take time to reflect on how we let in politics divide this country. And in, in we're not taking the time to remember, as I said earlier, that um, we are a democratic nation, that the, the democracy is messy, but uh, we, have, we have a process of how we uh, talk about our differences, right? In that we have to make sure that we protect democracy. Uh, and that has to do a lot with how we interact with others and also about how we don't talk to people that think have a different opinion than us, right? We don't take the time to listen. I'm not saying that you're gonna convince me, but at least we 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 are. You can hear my perspective about why I think things are this way, and and I can hear your perspective. We're getting to the point. I feel that we are going sometimes either too much to the right, too much to the left. And I think both are bad because they both meet at the end, right? So we have to be able to listen to someone else's perspective and, and at least let them explain your, their position. You don't have to agree with it, if, uh, but we need more conversations and more civility in, in our politics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I, I, I want to be very conscious of your time, and I realize you you've got a meeting in a in a in a few minutes, and you need to run off to it. So that, that felt to me like a a high note to end our conversation. Uh, I want to thank you so much for taking this time to talk with us. This is a terrific way for us to get uh, get our politics and policy series started. You're an inspiration to so many, not just uh, not just female potential candidates, not just uh, people from the minority communities, but for everybody. Um, and uh, uh, it's terrific to have you here and congratulations on becoming Lieutenant Governor. And uh, we learned a lot and uh, hopefully we'll have you back and have another conversation at some point.